Our second panel, the writer is the witness, features Imran Kovadia from South Africa, Mantla Langa from South Africa, and Paddy Harper. Paddy Harper. Um, let's welcome them to the stage, please. Good evening, everybody. Hello. Hi. Oh, sorry, I can't. This is weird. Um, folks, yeah, neither of the authors here really needs any introduction. Um, they're both people whose work really speaks for them, speaks for them. Um, particularly, I think, on the issue that we are, we are conversing on tonight, on the, the writer is the witness. I mean, both the, the, both the bodies of work, and in particular the, the most recent pieces, um, bear witness to kind of particularly tough, particularly vile, and particularly, um, at the same time, inspirational part of our history. Um, and they both tell the, that story with great detail, but also with a kind of great sense of overview and understanding, which I, I think yeah, it's, it's quite remarkable. Um, I think if we can start with the same format as, as the last session with a reading from each of the authors, and then we'll, we'll take it from there. And again, thanks very much. <coughs> I thought you were going to go alphabetically. <laughs> <laughs> We, we can go alphabetically. You want me to go first? You go first. Okay. I just chose a piece which <coughs> could have come from Mandler's book. <laughs> or at least maybe overlaps a bit with Mandler's. It's just a chapter later on, on in my novel. Uh, where there were sparks, there was fire. In Zambia in 1981, the chief had recruited him as an assistant. He used sparks to carry his vinyl briefcase and stay close to his person. He was the last line of defense. Each morning, sparks packed the briefcase with a satellite telephone, blinking on the top. Next to that went a Russian-English dictionary and a Makarov pistol. It came out at any possibility of danger. When there was a raid or a bombing, he covered the scene while the chief stayed in the background. The stretcher bearers brought out the bodies of men and women, boys and girls, their forms were unfamiliar until he checked their faces and recognized them as friends and colleagues. Sometimes the fire brigade had to use a welding torch to take someone out from behind the wheel of a car. Only when the ambulances left did the chief put his hand on that of his assistant and say, as seriously as if he were conducting the funeral, where there is sparks, there is fire. I expect fire. At night, at home or away, Spark slept on a mattress and the vestibule of his master's bedroom. For two decades, he was the nearest and dearest person to the chief, much closer in a practical sense than anyone else. He was the emissary dispatched in the first instance to fix a problem or correct a misinterpretation. In 1998, back in Pretoria, when it became up and known up and down the Union buildings that the old man was displeased with his second in command, Sparks brought the new crocodile skin briefcase to the private balcony, separated by a curtain from the corridor. Just inside the curtain, the chief packed his pipe, red brown strands of tobacco crammed under the rim. Sparks held the flame for him until smoke filtered shyly from the bowl. They went outside. The chief closed the buttons on his blazer and took a puff. The smoke filtered longingly from his neat lips and beard. He looked like a statue that was smoking not a sign of pleasure on his features. The chief balanced the pipe on the ledge, shading it with one hand as it smoldered, and frowned at the pools and fountains in the prospect, the mounted cannon, the square kilometer of terraced gardens, and the police memorial. His eyes were as reflective as sunglasses. I told you before and I will tell you again, where there is sparks, there is indeed fire. You weren't expected to reply to such statements. The chief stopped and returned the pipe to his mouth. Comrade Sparks, I wish that you still kept a gun in that briefcase. Some of the other comrades could use the encouragement. He pushed Sparks back through the curtain. Go and fix it now with the old man. He will take your word above mine. He trusts you above anyone. Remember this fact. 
He is the most famous old man in the world, but he is also the loneliest. The chief never came at it directly. He maintained a sideways angle to any situation, making sure that he had room to maneuver. He was a master diplomat. He would be sideways even in the bedroom, although Sparks tried not to listen to his encounters with women. I'll stop there, thank you. When she reflects back on it, it's all too late. It's as if it all never happened. And she's left with memories, snatches of remembered dialogue, color and feeling, especially feeling. Even with the most agent probing and interrogation that approximates a session before a panel of torturers, all she can come up with is a series of incidents, all connected to her flesh. She remembers things in terms of her body's recollection of texture, pressure, smell, and color, and of course, taste. These senses operated independently of her conscious understanding of things. There were times of pain, sometimes pleasure. She was back in those days, in that past in which she had no volition, like the woman she had read about, who could only under start understanding that she had been violated in a shack somewhere near the sea when she heard the call of, of seagulls. Why her? She doesn't know. On the one hand, she feels overwhelmed by the whole experience. On the other hand, she is like someone who has walked blindfolded and has only now been able to open her up the eyes. But strangely enough, the blindness made her all the more appreciative of pleasure. She remembers a moment, a note, a note, a piece of music composed by the flesh. And him? He was like a musician with a favorite instrument, which he had mastered, her body. He was like a masseuse, familiar with every contour, every fold. Now and then discovering a point he hadn't known, hearing her gasp in appreciation or pain or both, he would chuckle with triumph. What made her so special to be targeted by him? She doesn't know. His comment was that he saw her on the street and had already heard she had ambitions to become a revolutionary. Her beauty must have captivated him. She knew she was beautiful. She knew she was beautiful. People had told her so. She had seen the way Johannes, Sibisi, Brazef, even Muzi Tabete, although he might not have been aware he was looking at her, looked at her. And she knew she had some power, or could have some power over men. <coughs> was she the only one? There could have been more. He used women. He used men. How did he justify that? He simply said, we are at war. We have to do this to men, to women. Some come voluntarily, others are unwilling. At the end of the day, all of us, the captors and the captive, are locked up in a huge cage, and we have to find a way to get out. As she says this, she remembers feeling him exploring her depths, probing at the base of her stomach, where the womb ends and life begins. Did he ever say anything about his father? <clears throat> he maintained that his father was respected. His words were, even though he was now a pale imitation of what he used to be, people still held him in high esteem. And Strela, did he talk of his connection with Strela? No, he never, he, he never just came out and said anything about the people he was working with. But she could remember him saying something about someone who could have been his twin brother, a star in the making. A star in the making. Did he say that? Something to that effect. She now clams up, not so much out of bloody-mindedness 
as from a residual sense of shame, because that afternoon he was inside her when there was a change in tempo. You are thinking about other things again, she said to him, aware that he had slowed down. Somewhere hidden in the folds of her mind was the suspicion that if he started thinking, he might become even crueler. She needed him unthinking and automating a hardened body whose sole purpose, at least for that moment, was to provide pleasure. Yes, he said. What is it about, she asked, hoping to engage him in small talk until he could get his mojo back. Her whole time with him was a contradiction. She wanted him strong, but not so strong that he would hurt her. He said, my father. She wanted to say, imagine him inside me, but that kind of crack would have ended five against the mouth. I would like to meet him one day. I've heard so much about him. Then his mojo back, he started again, climbing one more hill with vigor this time until she moaned. When did this happen? Was it at the beginning of the relationship, affair, whatever? The beginning was the end for me, she says. Okay, that's all for now. Thank you. Um, perhaps if, if we can start with the issue, you're both um, novelists, both people who tell stories, to, to fictional stories, but in bo both these cases, both, both of these works, um, there's a, you're telling, in fact, a, a historical story, a, a factual story. How does, yeah, fiction as, as, a, a, as a tool of historical narrative, um, why, why, why that choice and, and, and how do you make it work? <laughs> um, yeah. uh, I think uh, the theme today is uh, a writer as witness or writing as bearing witness. Uh, incidentally, today is the 21st of March, which is a Human Rights Day in commemoration of the Sharpeville or the massacres in Sharpeville quite a long time ago. And uh, I think a lot has been written about that, but mainly in journalistic forms, not really. Uh, I can't think of a novel being used to uh, weave around that particular experience. But getting back to what I was saying, I think that uh, for me uh, specifically, and I think for a number of other writers, uh, fiction helps in telling possibly the kind of, of stories which if told in a so-called non-fictional or factual manner would lose um, a lot of possibilities insofar as giving life, giving voice to the characters that were part of those incidents. Um, we can talk, for instance, about uh, what is witness, what is, what is bearing witness. I think Nadine Godima, in one of her uh, interviews, speaks very lengthily about the role of the writer in, in giving this kind of voice, in being uh, both inside an incident and also outside of it, and then reflecting it to, 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 the, to the reader. I just think that uh, fiction gives me a lot more power uh, and a lot more capacity to dream around issues so that uh, when I then reflect on them, I reflect on them in a, in a fuller possibility, in a manner that gives as many people as possible a point of entry 
whether it's young people, old people, black people, white people, etc. Whereas if it were, I think, non-fiction or journalistic writing, respect to you, it would be uh, much, much different. Yeah. That's, sure. that's just my take. Right. I'd say that, um, I'd say that most writers, including myself, wouldn't see fiction as a way of writing historical narrative, mm -hmm. but historical narrative as a way of writing fiction, rather than, okay. you know, it's out of history you can make certain kinds of stories or sequences. Uh, and so you can create certain kinds of books that would otherwise be impossible to make. And I think secondly, uh, Michael Oakeshott, who's a kind of English philosopher, says, um, somebody says, people think, tend to describe life as a journey. Um, but he says that metaphor is wrong. Life, at any moment, life presents itself as a predicament. Mm. I think it's quite a useful insight. And to think, the temptation we think about history or the past is to see it in its forward movement, right? Um, people call that the Whig theory of history. In other words, to imagine that everybody, that things were always going to work out in the way that they worked out. So in some ways that makes, um, that dissolves each person's predicament. And I think uh, it's quite useful to go back and try to imagine just how intensely involved everyone was in his or her own predicament, 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, as, as today. Um, uh, and trying to reconstruct those predicaments is an interesting task of imagination. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the specific kind of incidents um, perhaps if, if we can start with you, with you, Mandla, um, which make up the, 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 the events, the narrative within the, st within the story. Um, how much of, of that is influenced by your, your, your personal experience, the, 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 the sort of the, the series of events that, that, that you've lived through yourself? How much of that feeds into the choices that you made of, 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 of the aspects of the broader story that, that, that were told here? <laughs> One of the things that I've really uh, uh, very clearly tried to run away from has been to tell an autobiographical mm. story in, in my fiction. I think in the past, possibly in the first novel, Tenderness of Blood, mm. uh, as, as with most first novels, there is a great temptation to go into the autobiographical, uh, deal with details that are very close to me. Uh, in fact, the book becomes a, 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 some kind of confession, even though I hadn't committed any sins. <laughs> But insofar as a, a texture of shadows, uh, it's a book that has lived with me for over 20 years uh, in various places, uh, in various forms, and in various states of mind, in the sense that these are observations um, of ever so many realities that I came across. And I think the work of of fiction is to take an experience and infuse it with a wholly different energy. Um, I have a lot of, and I also wanted to explore the 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 genre, which which I can call, for lack of a better word, a political thriller, mm -hmm. where uh, for the first time. I, I dabbled with, uh, the other day we had a panel here of incredibly murderous women from Peter Marisberg <laughs> uh, who were talking about uh, characters that they had consigned to the grave and uh, these were invariably men. But what, happened in, what happens in the book is I've explored the possibility of instead of an allegorical narrative, to face some of the uh, grittiness, some of the uglier, some of the uh, 
deeper circumstances around issues of death, issues of killing, issues of political violence uh, without hiding behind, how do you say this, the allegorical uh, uh, form. Because I have seen some of, of what I do describe, and some of it has happened in the context of my uh, own family. Mm -hmm. But it is by no stretch of the imagination a reflection, a story of what I personally have experienced. And I think that uh, it's a biggish book and it also has got a, a vast array of characters. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a lot of composite characters, people I've encountered and people I've dreamt of, mainly people I have dreamt of or have been dreamt up for me by others. And Imran, the, the, the choice of the sort of the incidents and the themes which, which you've explored in Tales of the Metric System, what, what, what sort of drove those choices? I don't know. Um, I mean, when we say personal identity, we tend to reduce that to a particular name and whatever happened in, in your individual biography. But, I mean, books also happen to you and stories that you hear about are also part of your life. And, as Madla points out, what you imagine is, is also part of the kind of larger container of your life. I mean, in a way, the point of novels, the stories, and movies is to expand what your personal experience is. Um, and sometimes you can imagine something better if it's a story told to you than if it's something you've gone through. Okay. But with all that said, I think, um, I, I think if you read a book and it seems like a pure performance, right, something that just has no connection to, certainly a novel, has no connection to the person who wrote it, as if it's something that's, that's just engineered. I think that's a failure in the, okay. probably in the engineering. So it has to seem in some <coughs> way connected to the, uh, to the author's life, but in, in an indirect or redirected way, of, in the way that Mandler is describing. Okay. Um, both the works co confront the more difficult Oh, well, both, in, the, in the storytelling, both confront the uncomfortable, more difficult um, sides of, of our history. Um, and, and of particularly uh, at a specific period. What, what are the challenges for people writing the history of this period? Um, how much flows from the the, the, that, that's that sort of earlier experience. Um, are the are the parallel? Are the how different is the challenge? Mm. I'll go very quickly now. Who was this? I think it was Martin Trump or one of the um, people commenting on South African literature. Of I think I read this in the 90s of the last. 50 years, and he was saying that it, it's almost like an, a polemic, an apartheid polemic. And uh, I think the difficulty with writing about South Africa, especially writing about uh, in the South, Af South African fiction, has been the temptation to work on um, material that has already been worked mm. for you, a plot that's already uh, written itself, as it were, in the headlines, in the everyday circumstances, in sometimes in popular theater. Uh, I remember when I was growing up <coughs> in Guamashu, we would really um, kill ourselves to go and watch some of the plays by Gibson Kent, uh, which inevitably have got certain tropes, certain uh, obvious uh, representations that are supposed to be representations of the lives of, of black people. There would be a priest who's all forgiving, 
<laughs> there would be a cantankerous uh, Shibin queen mm. who will drag you out of uh, <laughs> wherever you might be if you, <coughs> if you owe her. There would be a Zoti of mm. sorts, and then there would be a, a, some a, what James Baldwin calls some weak eyed visionary <laughs> who would be, as it were, the praise or the spirit of, 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 the, of, the, of, of, the, of the play. And uh, of course, there would be somebody who would die, and there would be kinning and wailing uh, at the graveyard, and uh, someone would break into a song. <laughs> the fiction that uh, South Africa presents to us mm. presents fiction that uh, we, you have these uh, common, normal, usual figures, the cruel policemen, uh, so stereotypes stitched together. And uh, I think for, for me, there has been, it's always an attempt to deal with the interiority of the characters, <coughs> what makes people uh, do the things they do or not do the things they do? How do they wake up in the morning? How do they sing? How do they make love? How do they laugh? Um, rather than uh, just these cardboard cutouts. And I think that is the big difficulty. Every time <coughs> I come across a, a people, young people who say, I've written this manuscript and uh, I really want to get it published, and what can you do? How can you help me? And I immediately refer them uh, to publishers, although I know that that's not what I'm supposed to do, because in most cases you find that those manuscripts are exactly those cliches <coughs> that I'm talking about, and uh, they're also being a singular failing among some people, I'm not going to say among young people, of uh, in <coughs> investing in reading and reading and reading as much as possible, which is where I think um, people would then be able to find and look at other examples of how other people have written and uh, also <coughs> just get the experiences of, uh, I think, even other cultures. That's for me is uh, is how I see it, you know. I I, mean, I agree entirely. Um, I think that I don't know how history should be <coughs> written, but I have views on how books should be written, and I think we have to admit as South Africans, partly because of the crudeness of our social <coughs> cleavages, because of the obviousness of our political economic problems because of our position on the apparent periphery of a larger system, we just have extraordinary love of kitsch and junk. Mm -hmm. you know, junk ideas, junk rhetoric, kitsch books. I don't want to get into a fight with any contemporary writers because they're very frightening people. <coughs> but, uh, if you think about it, who are the national artists and writers of South Africa, the great the people who represent our spirit? It's probably Trechikov and Wilbur Smith. You know? Those are our great products. <laughs> And it comes from a certain kind of, it comes from kind of lowest common denominator of, of thinking, of feeling, and of, of kind of commercialization. So those are the huge problems involved in seeing things clearly and vividly and crisply and logically. And to understand the past or to, to write books about the present, you have to resist or try to resist those kinds of temptations. But also you have to realize that those temptations are deep in the soul of most radio reviewers, um, uh, book reviewers, many, not all, uh, bookstores. And what they want to substitute, you know, interesting books cause you certain kinds of pleasure, but also certain kinds of pain, uh, certain kinds of immersion. And what we're substituting for them it, almost in almost every case is a kind of junk literature which gives you much vaguer versions of those things. Generally almost no pain, except of a kind of pornographic uh, or sensory kind, and kind of vague kinds of pleasure which are involved in having cliches of the kind Mandela refers to 
confirmed or reconfirmed for you. And frankly, resisting that is, is probably the most important challenge that writers have. Both, both the works have been, you know, are, are, are written with, with the gift of, of, of hindsight, which um, and the, the understanding which comes with that, which, which one doesn't have when writing in, in the sort of immediate. Um, how much does that, and both the works are not black and white, both explore the gray areas of our history, of our world, of, of human beings. Um, how, how, no, sorry, how does one articulate this? But, but how, how important for both of you is the exploration of those kind of undefined areas, the, the sort of the uncomfortable areas that... I think hindsight is, de is obviously deceptive for the reasons that we can all understand. It implies that history has a meaning and a direction that we can decipher and understand who the good guys and bad guys are. And uh, the, it would be very different writing a novel, a historical novel about South Africa in 1995 than it is nowadays. Right? And the unco most uncomfortable thing we all trying to figure out is what, is, what are the continuous facts? What, what, what's undoing our democracy and how is that continuous with how it was born? And are there things about our society or culture that, um, that persisted and changed color somewhat between 1990 and 94? Um, and I think that is, that's the hardest question to ask. I mean, my, my guess right now is that it's not race so much as kind of a love of inequality, you know? That, in a sense, the, our country from the very beginning had. It was founded in trying to get one person to do work for you, to command per person. And that's kind of remained constant. You know, whenever we faced with the need to be an actual democratic country where equality is required, we'll always choose inequality, we'll always try and create exceptions to equality. And I think probably uh, as a writer, it's quite hard to get at that phenomenon. But that's probably the key thing we're all, many of us are asking, trying to mm. get at. <clears throat> when you talk of the <laughs> of the past, uh, even of the recent recent past, uh, you are also talking of a past that has been informed by uh, notions of what the battle, the struggle uh, that obtained during that past, how it was how it was shaped. And uh, I think in the most, we create uh, a series of myths about how uh, that struggle was and how those battles uh, were fought. I remember some time back when I got involved in a task group on government communications and we went to various um, places in this country and elsewhere to look at, you know, get an, a sense of the demographics, who are the people who are at the lowest rung of the totem pole reading comes to accessing information. And it was no surprise uh, to find that the woman who is tilling the land, the plowing the fields in Limpopo, for instance, would be the, the person most likely uh, to be outside of the loop insofar as information is concerned. And then you start to look at what that means uh, when you go into some of these communities in, in 2006, no, 1996, and people still ask you, uh, yeah, we can hear everything you're saying, but when really is Mandela going to be released? Mm. Then you realize that uh, you operate on the basis that everybody is on the same uh, level of understanding of what's going on, whereas 
Uh, I think Tabumbegi did speak one time about, you know, two countries existing mm. in, 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 in one country. It's even more complicated than that. Um, because even the, that one country that is disadvantaged, meaning that's phenomenally, overwhelmingly black and female, that in itself is a reality that uh, impacts very little on this country that is overwhelmingly uh, gifted with everything that it, it, can, it can have. Then you look at all that, then you see to yourself, if then you start writing, uh, to what extent do you also nod, because that's, only, that's the only thing you can do, since you are not uh, able to come up with a, a, um, a panacea for all the evils that are happening, you can only nod to that constituency of those women from Limpopo who are without any possibilities of uh, So in addressing the past, in, in writing, as far as I'm concerned, I think we have to, um, when we're in the camps, we used to say we need to march at the pace of the slowest. You need to find a way of um, bringing out, perhaps, some of the elements that exist in, 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 in society that otherwise would remain totally unaddressed. Thank you. Um, should we take some questions from the floor now? Are we with time? Yeah, uh, what a wonderful pa panel, both the writers and the moderator. I thank you for the very rich conversation. I have, I have a question for Brahmanda, if I can. It seems that um, the texture of shadows, very complex, beautifully complex work, uh, but it seems that one of the centers, one of the moral centers is in the character Narissa, Dr. Doc, yeah. Narissa. And I'm curious about that, as this is an Isi Zulu speaking Indian woman who, as she says, sometimes passes for an ignorant auntie um, and she is loved by and protected and honored by all these men uh, living here in KZN for a couple of years. Th this is not the, the, the dominant narrative. So I'm, I'm interested if, if she was um, a historic figure or why you chose her as one of the mm -hmm. centers of morality for this tale. Very quickly, uh, one of the noddings that I've been speaking about, when I was uh, in exile in, in Lesotho, the one person that uh, we were very, how do you say this, inexperienced, still raw, coming from South Africa, and uh, finding ourselves in a place where we really needed to be incredibly careful, not realizing that Lesotho was in the belly of, 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 of South Africa. And the person that uh, took us by hand, our hand, was uh, uh, Phyllis Naidu, who has since passed on. And uh, she, she was, uh, she also suffered a bomb attack a letter bomb, which left uh, many of the people around her maimed for life. But it was the fact that uh, Phyllis exuded such, you know, humanity that uh, I felt, possibly without really thinking about it, that uh, there is a story beyond uh, Phyllis Naidu, there must be a way to uh, yeah, pay homage to her. The issue of language of, a, of an Indian auntie speaking Zulu 
is something that has actually happened in various places. I know of uh, Zulu speaking or whatever African language speaking, South Africans who have been so mortified and embarrassed in certain instances when they speak uh, even in lingo in, in, about somebody they find in a lift. This happened to two South African friends of mine who were in a lift in London. <laughs> and uh, they were seeing this one woman whom they thought was, uh, did not understand what they were saying. And they were commenting on her vital statistics. <laughs> and uh, at the end, just when the, they were getting out of the lift, she said to them that, uh, He's an reporter, he's he's Baba Win. I'll report you to your fathers because, <laughs> and in, 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 in Zulu, and they almost collapsed, you know. And uh, that also taught me never to think that <laughs> any other person does not understand what I'm saying because uh, that, that, that's, that's dangerous. But much more importantly, I, I, I created Nerissa. Uh, the way I did because I wanted to make sure that this becomes a, a, a figure that is worthy of respect, especially somebody who's respected by other soldiers, other of the People's Army. People's Army, not MK. <laughs> <laughs> um, over here. seems to not be interested in reading anymore, and number two, a generation that seems to no longer be interested in history. Thanks. <laughs> sure. How do we write for a generation that's no longer interested in history and a generation that is not interested in reading? I think that's a tall order. Um, <laughs> I think that um, something that I said earlier about uh, there being a need for people to read, but there's an even greater agency in, in South Africa in that um, reading needs to be encouraged from uh, I think the primary classes as, as early as possible. I wanted to say, to answer your question and say that I regard this generation, if it has not started reading, to be already doomed, but that's, that's not a correct thing to say. I would just say that uh, this generation uh, is a lot more um, advantage in the sense that it's got such a, a huge menu of choices insofar as literature is concerned, which is not something, which is something that we were not favored with when we grew up. We grew up in a country that, had, that practiced censorship, where you really came across important texts or texts that could change your life through you know, accidents really, rather than a design. I think uh, are, what is good now is that a lot of younger people are writing themselves, and perhaps with that, there will be uh, a possibility for them to write in a manner, in a language that appeals uh, to their peers. I know for a fact that uh, Younger people are writing for television, younger people are writing 
you know, for all sorts of uh, of media. I don't know whether Imran has, since he's a, a new father, whether... My son is uh, not writing yet, but he's... <laughs> <laughs> he's only 11 months old. Yeah. The older one is may, may be writing. I don't know much about the younger generation. But the, the huge... Um, the thing to note about all younger generations is eventually they become the older generation. And um, <laughs> if you look at... I don't, we don't know the numbers for South Africa. I don't really. But um, if you look at the U.S., who buys most books? Right? It's, it's, it's parents, right? mothers and fathers, generally white, upper middle class. But uh, if you look at the, what they read, men tend to read uh, military history and women tend to read novels. And I think they're reading them for a good reason. There's something quite powerful in people that forces, that pushes them towards certain kinds of books. And I think... Um, the reason mothers read novels is they want, they want, they need insight into how configurations of people work, into how relationships build up or break down, into what society is like. And I think to the extent that people find that need here, they'll start reading. They may not start reading at 22. They may not start reading at 12. Maybe they start reading at 42. Um, but, you know, you read for a whole bunch of, ideally you read for a bunch of reasons that are quite vital for you, right? You see things changing and disappearing uh, because you've just been around long enough, they disappear, you, you, you see something odd about human beings or s stuff around you and you want to kind of understand that. Um, there's certain kinds of pleasure or desire that you can only experience inside a book. They, they seem to happen enough. Now, it may, it may still all collapse, it's certainly looking that way, but um, if you look at the history of classical music, people got worried about 50 years ago because they looked at um, who goes to the opera, for example, who goes to classical music concerts. Everybody who goes there is old right? and will basically die within the next 10, 20 years. So people, cultural critics ask themselves, but you know, what's going to happen? In, you know, it's 1950 now. What's going to happen in 1970? Everyone in this room will be dead. Um, and it turned out there were a whole crop of new old people. Right? Uh, <laughs> So I think, I think there's probably going to be some new old people, uh, new mothers and fathers. Uh, any f over, f over there? Uh, Susan? Hello. I just wanted to ask you, Imran, about the comment you made about that we choose inequality. Mm. That we always seem to choose inequality. What I wanted to know was, like, who is we? Oh. No, and um, the better, the better ones amongst us. <laughs> <It's a joke>. <laughs> <laughs> and what are we talking about here? Because inequality is about power, isn't it? Mm. And um, <coughs> greed and selfishness, really, mm. when we're not prepared to share, and also capitalism. Yeah. Um, which is an entrenched kind of situation. So I'd like you to elaborate on that, yeah. please. No, I mean, I think you're right. Look, I wouldn't pin it to a social system as such. What struck me is, across the board, even when you look at trade unions in South Africa, you know, or townships or upper class suburbs, people really try to establish hierarchies of distinction. They um, Maybe to, maybe to turn it around the other way. If you lived in other societies where, even much richer societies, you, you see that equality is actually something that people prize. You know, uh, If you live in the US for a while or you visit Germany, there's a kind of... Um, German friendships are quite long-lasting and deep, and they don't, they're not dependent on class in the same way that our friendships are. Americans really value being able to disagree with people higher up in the hierarchy. And even though they're very materialistic, in a way our materialism is much stranger because mm. the moment we can afford something, we, you know, I think across the board, black, white, rich, poor, we, we spend as much as we can to show off how we're better than the other person. And for me, the attitude is also about the law. You know, Previously, the National Party exempted itself from the law. Now, sections of our ruling parties, wherever they are, exempt themselves from the law. So, I mean, 
yes, there are probably social determinants, political determinants, capitalism. But I'm sure if we had socialism, we'd find a way to make it extremely hierarchical, <laughs> unequal. Um, so I don't think it's, um, I don't, I don't want to claim it's the causal principle, but it seems to me that the reason all our institutions are losing legitimacy and validity is, is, is that we've realized that it's much, it's, it's much less expensive to choose inequality. You know, equality has a lot of. There's a lot. Of, it's difficult to be an equal person along other, alongside other equal people. You have to give up some stuff about yourself. You have to listen to other people harder and work with them harder. Um, but so, but that so that's my analysis. It may, it may be a very superficial one, but it's the only one I have right now of this kind of quite global, countrywide collapse we're seeing or disintegration. Um, do we have time for a final question? Uh, I might just make uh, two questions. I have a, a question cool. for each of, of the, the writers. Uh, firstly, Imran, I'd just like to ask, uh, in relation to em uh, empathy, in relation to uh, writing about uh, history, um, how do you write about characters who might be making decisions or doing things that you as an author and as a person might not necessarily agree with, but how do you write that in an empathetic way um, and not in a sort of judgmental way? Um, and for you, uh, Bob Lang, um, based on the extract that you just read, uh, I think you write in a very, interest, in a very interesting way about uh, sex and, and sexuality. I'm always very struck by the absence of sexuality in, in the characters of a lot of of South African writers. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about sort of what is your thought process when, you, when you're writing about that or when you're thinking about sexuality in relation to the, peop to the characters you're writing about? It's going to put me in trouble with my wife. <laughs> <laughs> that is true, and, and, and uh, Mandla's wife is formidable. <laughs> <laughs> but, but wonderful. So, um, the cat, the diff you know, I think also your, the, the, the extent to which we can imagine other people is quite wide, and the extent to which we can pretend to imagine them is even wider. So a lot of writing is engineering, you know, to make it look right. Um, for me, it's less about the decisions than trying to figure out or, or trying to remember what was it like in 1970 or 1973 and stuff. And really what I remember about this country is just it was so controlled and policed, you know? Uh, I think as my sister used to put it, before 1990, we were terrified of the police, of a police car. Now we were, now we're happy to see a police car. Although now I'm not sure. Any, she said this in about 2000. <laughs> now we're probably back to being terrified of a police car again. But um, we were such a, you know, we were such an almost like middle-aged society in 1970, and it was reconstructing that was fascinating for me. You know, news took. You got news in these kind of in these uh, paper editions of English newspapers that the only way you could get outside news was mailed in. And the government would often cut out articles. You wouldn't see them. Uh, telephone calls had to be booked you know, all this time in advance. You could only go to certain parts of the city. You were very conscious of where you were walking. I think just trying to remember that stuff is really worth it. And there's a lot of powerful, it's very powerful impulse in us to forget that. You know, there's a very intense, weird rewriting of that period. If you look at, um, uh, you know, in an odd way, Pick Boiter is not a totally unreasonable person. But if you read what he says about the 70s and 80s, he said, he says, we were actually just trying to hand over the country. You know? uh, yeah. Read what he said just a few weeks ago. He said, we were desperately trying to find someone to hand the country over. But before that could happen, you know, all this stuff, all this other stuff could happen. Um, and that argument about, you know, how the National Party was modernizing desperately and trying to find responsible people, it's actually a much more widely accepted argument than... Um, uh, than you would think. Um, so I think remembering and, and understanding those environments is, is, is important for us and interesting as well. Mm -hmm. <coughs> One of the uh, areas that's always intrigued me when writing about sex is uh, since I've never been of the opposite sex, I've had to try and imagine as much as possible uh, what the whole issue of sex, uh, the whole mystery and the mystique um, 
and I've had to put myself, I've had to borrow a stratagem that was used by James Baldwin when he wrote Giovanni's Room, which is a, I think the only novel by a black American about, totally about white Americans. And um, it became a bestseller, as, as, as you will know. I did ask questions, uh, and in certain instances, I almost got slapped upside my face <laughs> for asking some of the questions about, about sex, about aspects of it, about mechanic zims of it, and uh, uh, and, but at the end of the day, um, if it's something that has caused someone to have an interest in it and it's from what I've written, I think I have succeeded in imagining um, what because it's, it's, it's written here from the point of view of a woman. And uh, someone said, and I don't know whether this is true, that uh, the only time when men and women are experiencing sex in the same way is when there is anal penetration, I don't know. I just thought, let me throw that in. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so it's something, uh, it's, it's researching, it's asking people, it's talking to people, um, it's understanding that I know absolutely nothing about this. Mm -hmm. And as a writer, it's also a matter of imagination. Coming to the question that was being asked uh, uh, to Imram, I remember that uh, the issue of not knowing uh, was explicated by um, Chinua Achebe when he was speaking about how in Nigeria sometimes in the past people thought when you invited them and you wrote RSVP, you meant rice and stew very plenty. <laughs> so I just thought I'd throw that also in. <laughs> so, people, thank you very much.